Welcome everyone to the latest session in your Alumni Association's UNB Talks online series. Today's session is about reinventing your career search in the, these uncertain times in the year 2021. My name is Michelle McNeil. I'm the Executive Director of UNB's Associated Alumni, and I'm really pleased to be the moderator for today's discussion. Uh, one of the things I love most about our online events is that alumni can join us from all over the world. Um, so as an example, today we have people that have registered to attend from all across Canada and the US, as well as China, Hong Kong, India, Poland, Saudi Arabia, and quite a few people from Trinidad and Tobago as well. So um, it's really great to have all of you join us today. I encourage you to let us know where you're joining us from in the chat uh, and, uh, and welcome. The one thing, regardless of where we're living, the one thing that connects us all is our connection back to UNB. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping things before I introduce our panelists. So we are using the webinar mode in Zoom today, and so that means that we can't see one another and we can't speak to one another. Um, you'll just hear and, and see myself and the two panelists, but I do encourage you to use the chat function. Um, tell us where you're joining us from, connect with one another, maybe uh, share any reactions or observations to some of the things that we're discussing. Uh, the chat tends to get quite busy in these sessions, and so I would encourage you if you have any questions that you want to ask the panelists to submit those through the Q&A function in Zoom. So along the bottom of your screen, there should be a little tab that says Q&A, and that's where we would encourage you to submit your questions just to make sure that we see them. Uh, we have an hour and we're not going to get to all of the questions. Many of you, when you registered, submitted really great questions to us. And so we're going to start the session with some questions that we developed based on what you submitted. Uh, but I, we obviously have time at the end to ask questions that come through the session. So one of the great things about the Q&A tab is when you submit a question in there, uh, people can upvote it. So if you see a question that someone else posed and you want the answer to that question too, you can go in and upvote it. And then uh, makes my job as a moderator a bit easier because at the end, uh, I, when I'm asking questions, I can go and see which ones most people want answered. So. Um, and then one of the things we try to do with our webinars, uh, after, after the session, we'll, we'll send out the recording to the session, we'll send out a post-event survey, and we'll also try to answer any questions that people really wanted answered but we didn't have time for in the hour. So we'll do our best to, to get as many answers as we can to you. So with all of that said, uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce our panelists. So we're going to start with Sherry Merzero. Sherry spent the last 30 years working in human resources with one of the largest privately owned organizations in Atlantic Canada. Uh, she currently serves as the human resources director for one of its divisions. She's worked in almost every aspect of human resources, spanning the entire employee life cycle. So it brings a lot of great experience to this discussion today. Sherry earned a Bachelor of Arts from UMB as well as a labor relations certificate from Queen's University. Uh, she also has a long list of certifications, so uh, settle in because I'm going to list a few of them. So she's a Chartered Professional in Human Resources, a Certified Six Sigma Green Belt, uh, a Certified Benefits Professional, and she holds a Graduate Certificate in Executive Coaching from Royal Roads University. We're so grateful to have you join us today, Sherry. Thank you. Uh, and next up we have Adam Crean. And so Adam is a senior consultant with Meridia Recruitment Solutions. It's a Knightsbridge Roberts and Surrett uh, company that connects leading organizations with top talent. Uh, Adam's experience is primarily in recruitment and he specializes in the legal, marketing, finance, accounting, HR and administration fields in the Ontario market. So Adam's joining us today from Ontario. Uh, Adam earned a first class honors BBA with a concentration in accounting from UMB, where he also played on the Varsity Reds basketball team. So some of you may have watched him play while he was with us. Uh, and he's also earned a CPA and a CMA designation. So thank you so much, Adam, for being here to share your expertise uh, and insights with us. Welcome, Sherry and Adam. Thanks for having me. So uh, to get things started today, we wanted to get a bit of a sense of who's joining us. So we have a quick poll. Uh, Jenny and Diana are working in the background, so we'll, we'll launch the poll that we want to share with you. Um, we just want you to answer a little bit about what your current employment status is. This is completely confidential. We have no idea what your answer is, so there's, there's no risk there. Uh, but we're asking you, you should have the poll up in front of you now. Um, asking you to choose whether you're working your, in your preferred field but looking for advancement opportunities whether you're currently unemployed and want to find employ employment within your field, uh, maybe you're working but want to change your career direction entirely, or maybe you're unemployed and just looking for, for different career opportunities. So uh, hopefully uh, that apply, those apply to almost everyone. So 
I'll just give it a couple more seconds there and then uh, Jenny's gonna close the poll and we'll share the results so that we can get an idea of who's joining us today. That'll help uh, Sherry and Adam, that'll help you a little bit to see the results and see who you're, who you're talking to, what their interest is in. So Jenny, maybe you can close that and, and share the results with everyone. Oh, so it's a pretty mixed group actually. Um, luckily, um, lots of people working right now. And there's also um, some people that are looking to find employment within their field or just really open to different career opportunities. So it's a, a nice little mix there. That'll help you guys, Sherry and Adam, with your, with your responses today. So, um, Really what we're gonna start off with is some of the questions that we developed for you based on what was submitted to us online. Um, we are gonna start our first question today with you, Adam, if you're, if you're ready for that. Uh, we're wondering if you can share with us, <laughs> I hope you're ready because we're gonna ask it. So uh, we're wondering if you can share with us the most interesting recruitment trends that you've been witnessing uh, in our current context. So throughout the pandemic and in 2021, and maybe use your crystal ball a little bit to tell us if you think these trends uh, will impact recruitment in the long run. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. That's a great question. I think that's a good way to put it, a crystal ball. I think everybody's wondering what's uh, what's here to stay and, and what's just you know here temporarily because of uh, what's transpired over the last 10 months to a year. Um, I'd say the most interesting or the most common trends that we've seen over the last year um, have been the, um, uh, you know, the new wave of doing video interviews and that becoming the norm, um, virtual onboarding, um, and then the, um, the ubiquitous nature of, of remote work. I think everybody's uh, been involved in remote work in one way or another, uh, regardless of where you live um, over the last year. Um, so starting with the Zoom or the, the video interviews, um, you know, if we look back before the pandemic, there was a time when us as uh, external consultants or, or in-house HR managers would invite in, individuals in to interview. And, and, and generally speaking, uh, those prospects would have to take a day, half day off work, um, get dressed up, drive to you know, downtown or wherever the, the office is, you know, wait nervously within a, uh, within a reception area and then meet with the hiring manager or the stakeholders for an hour, hour and a half, and then drive back uh, to their, their regular nine to five. I think one thing that's really, you know, the silver lining about the, the video interviews is that it's created a lot of efficiencies and um, you can do it from the comfort of your home or, you know, a private office or, you know, I've, I've, I wouldn't recommend this, but I've seen coffee shops. Um, we've just created a lot of efficiencies where I think that this, at least in the early rounds of the recruitment phase, is, is here to stay and, and I hope that it is. Um, just because of, of how effective um, it is on, on everyone's time. Um, moving on from that is, is the next stage in the recruitment process is when the successful candidate is hired. Uh, we've seen a lot of virtual onboarding and kudos to the top tier clients um, or uh, employers who have been able to do this really successfully. Um, people had to adapt and, and when you know, hiring freezes ended, people still needed to be hired. And if they were working in a region um, due to safety protocols, couldn't um, come into the office safely, they had to be onboarded um, entirely virtually. And, and we've seen this from the very, very junior ranks all the way up to the C-suites uh, of organizations. Um, so that's onboarding from a knowledge sharing, cross-training, um, you know, collaboration, camaraderie standpoint, the, the sharing of confidential information, getting people set up on payroll and, and sending out, um, you know, equipment and technology, um, all in a really effective manner. Um, whether I think this will remain the norm, I, I can't see it on a, on a large scale, <clears throat> especially if you're a people leader um, or you're in a role um, that, you know, is enhanced by, you know, meeting with people and, 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 you know, really having those relationships flourish through being in the office. In some instances where people are deemed fully remote and they're not close to any regional office or anything like that, you know, I think that will maybe continue, uh, especially if you're in a, you know, again, a fully remote capacity. But I think, um, you know, those uh, initial impressions, first impressions are definitely enhanced by, um, uh, you know, uh, in-person onboarding. So uh, I think we'll see a mix um, of, of, of this moving forward. But my guess, again, to look into the crystal ball is I think that employers will want to onboard people in person. 
Um, and then, you know, branching off that, the remote work, this is something that, again, we've all seen. Um, it's been great in terms of flexibility. Um, people, you know, if you're in the GTA, you're in a really busy market, um, you don't have to do your three hour commute daily. Um, there's a little less hustle and bustle. Um, but on the flip side of that, it's created, um, you know, a larger field of candidates that can apply for roles. Um, we post on our website, um, you know, if, uh, if an employer is open to it, remote across Canada. So uh, once upon a time, you were only competing with your, um, you know, your, your, the candidate pool within your respective market. Now it's all of Canada, maybe even all of North America, uh, depending on time zones. Um, so this can be good in a lot of ways if you're in New Brunswick and, you know, roles that would only be available to you in a, in a GTA or in Vancouver or elsewhere in Canada, this can create some new opportunities, but again, um, it can also create some, uh, some new competition. Um, whether or not the remote work is, is here to stay, I think this is the big question that everybody's wondering. Um, I think in some fields, you'll see it at a higher level, a higher scale. In other fields, I think that individuals will return to the office in higher numbers. Um, and I think if you asked any executive, any hiring manager, any business owner, um, the preference would be some sort of a hybrid, two days on, three days off, or an agreement with employer and employee in terms of the, the work from home arrangement. Um, I, I think it'll be a, a hybrid moving forward. So, so those are the, the, the main trends that I've seen over the last uh, year. That's great, Adam. Uh, when you were talking, it was like you were speaking right to our experience. We, uh, we hired somebody and had to onboard them in an entirely virtual, she was in a different province, the whole thing. Yeah. And I think it was September, the first time that the team actually met her in person. And I think that's the last time <laughs> any of us did. So uh, yeah. it's, it, you never could have imagined it before, before now. So. <laughs> um, so just as a follow up, then you focused on a lot of the positive things that have happened. I'm wondering, uh, for those people that are just, uh, they want to test the waters, or they're just getting into the job market, can you talk about some of the challenges that we're seeing right now for those people and maybe some tips you might have for them to overcome those challenges? Yeah, absolutely. Another great question. So, um, you know, entering, testing, testing the job market or entering a job market in any time is, is difficult. It can be intimidating. And depending on how long it has been since you, you know, put your, put yourself out there, it, it, it can just get more intimidating, right? Um, some of the things that, we've seen and, and heard from candidates as being um, some constant challenges or new challenges um, really re revolve around networking. Um, when you think about how the, the pandemic has really affected us, it's affected how we interact with one another. Um, you know, the old school ways of going to networking events or you know being a part of certain groups and associations and kind of building your network that way it's really changed it's really shifted um, um, by necessity to a digital platform and and where I would recommend people you know building their you know professional profile and the professional network is on LinkedIn um, you know it's it's the biggest professional network networking tool in the world. I think last time I checked, there was over 500 million people on there. I think there's probably more now over the last year. It's probably up to their subscribers. Um, and, and that's just, that's one of the, the challenges is if you're not um, someone that is, is um, active on that platform, I would encourage you to do so. Update your, your professional profile, update your skills, learn, like you, there's lots of crash courses on there to learn about um, how to navigate the platform, but also how to join groups, um, you know, um, you know, professional etiquette on there um, and start to build and, and familiarize yourself with how to network on that tool. Um, you know, genuine outreach and, and, you know, first level connections are a good place to start because they can be less cold, more welcoming, uh, but then seek out industry leaders, whether it's in the industry that you're in, you want to stay there. Um, or in uh, an industry you're looking to transition into. Um, it will take some time to get used to, especially if it's new for you. Um, and then taking that next step and meeting with people. Again, if you're in a region where safety protocols don't allow it, then maybe you're going to have to do video meetings like this or, or setting up, we call them virtual coffees with individuals if you can't actually meet them in person. Um, Again, for somebody entering the market, going back to what I was saying about um, 
you know, the job market potentially being more competitive um, on top of if it's been a while since you've looked for a new opportunity, um, there may be more competition out there. There may be less opportunities. There may be more opportunities. Who knows? It really depends on what field you're in. Um, but you have to take it upon yourself to understand what skill sets, what competencies are in demand, um, where you shine and where you potentially don't shine um, and understand those, uh, those places that you should fall short. Um, it's a great a time as any to, to um, you know, educate yourself uh, for uh, you know, a, a pretty cost-effective way. Um, there's lots of platforms like Coursera and, and to mention again, LinkedIn, I swear to God, I don't work for them. I just use it a lot. LinkedIn Learning has a, um, a lot of offerings um, that are free or, or at a very, very minimal cost. And maybe it's not even something that you want to um, add to your resume like you would uh, you know, college or university education or a designation, but it may just leave you feeling a little bit more confident and, and self-aware when you're talking to those thought leaders, those indus industry leaders, when you reach out and, and do your uh, digital networking. Um, those would be two challenges that I think, um, you know, are definitely relevant right now. And, and hopefully those are some, some tips on how, uh, how you can overcome them. Yeah, the linked one resonates quite a bit. I think we'll, LinkedIn, uh, we'll talk about quite a bit, I think today, and I have a little bit of information at the end of the session, but I know even though I'm not searching for a job right now, I use it way more now than I ever did. I, I started right. in this job sort of right before the pandemic hit. And my options for networking with other alumni relations professionals and, and learning in that regard were pretty limited. So I've, I've been using it from that perspective, but for anyone attending that is looking for ways to sort of build their networks within LinkedIn, the other thing I was amazed at was when I logged in and saw a little over 50,000 UMB alumni who have their profiles in there. So even yeah. just connecting with people that you have a connection through the university that you went to is a, is a good way to start too. That's, that's really great. Thanks for that, Adam. So Sherry, we're going to move over to you, and we're wondering if you can tell us how recruiters um, are selecting and vetting candidates during the pandemic. So sort of before that um, interview process, how, how is that the same or different from before? And do you think that this change will continue post-pandemic? Sure, oh, thank you. Um, it's a really good question, because when you look at it, that piece of the whole recruiting process, I wouldn't say has changed. Um, so, you know, prior to meeting with an individual, um, we go through all the same process that we went through in the past. So I think it's really important that you you really customize and take a look at your resume when you're when you're um, applying for a position and make sure it matches up with what your employer is actually looking for. Um, you know, Adam has said it previously as well. You know, video is is the new game, and everyone's doing video recruitment. I mean, that's how we do it today. So you know, if you think back you know, almost a year ago today, <laughs> um, doing video recruitment would have been the anomaly. It's now the norm. I mean, that's just how we do things today. Um, we're actually in the midst of, so we're recruiting people from all across the world, to be honest with you, um, from the UK, from Australia, from um, North, America, North America, you name it, we're recruiting people. So I work at Irving Shipbuilding. So um, when you look at shipbuilding, we don't have a lot of shipbuilders in Canada. We're, we're not just building ships, we're building shipbuilders. So we're trying to bring some of that expertise into our group. So we're actually looking at doing some video work um, to show a day in the life of what does it look like here for people who can't fly here, take a look to see what Nova Scotia has to offer. And so we're looking at it not just from the, from the aspect of what does Nova Scotia have to offer to you, but also what does us as an organization have to offer you. Well, that's really interesting to hear. I, 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 it resonates with me when you talk about how much it's changed because there was a time when I would be hiring someone where I would have viewed having to do a video call or a telephone call for an interview as a bit of a uh, disadvantage to the candidate. And now it's like totally leveled the playing field. So yeah. Oh no, we've that. got individuals who are, who are coming in. They're still here in Nova Scotia. Um, yeah and video calls because, you know, again, with, with the pandemic going on, we don't want to put people at risk and yeah. it's worked extremely well. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. So uh, along the same lines, but when people are thinking about how to get their profile noticed, so whether that's their resume, their LinkedIn profile, but just how to, how to be noticed, how to get in the door, um, where everything's digital and online now. And as Adam mentioned, there's no networking events. You're not going to your chamber after hours event or anything like that. 
are there certain skills or character traits that will help someone get their um, their profile noticed in the current context, things that they should be paying attention to? Again, I mentioned it earlier. I think it's so important that when you create your profile, so many organizations are using um, systems where you have to create a profile within the system. Really take extreme caution and, and really look at what you're putting in there. And I can't reiterate that enough because a lot of the times many companies are going to the point where you know, we're using AI, so we're using artificial intelligence that's actually going in and mining a bunch of, bunch of the data for us and pulling key attributes out. So I think it's important that you clearly show and demonstrate the requirements that are contained within the job posting um, because we're really trying to match those up. Um, you know, to stand out, um, you really want to make sure you're aligning with what that company is looking for as well. So really understand kind of the values of that organization. What are the business strategies of that organization? So really going in and, and doing your homework beforehand, I think is important. So um, yes, we're interviewing you, but in the same token, you're interviewing us as an organization as well. Great, think thanks. Oh. When, you, when you think of some of the skills, I think, you know, um, managing change and being resilient is one of a, a couple of the key attributes we're really looking for in individuals because that's, you know, in this, our environment is changing so quickly that people need to understand that, that they, they as well need to change, change quickly as well. Thank you, Sherry. Your last point uh, made me think about uh, in January, we did one of these webinars that was uh, particularly about um, change management. We had a change man management professional lead it. So if there's anyone uh, on the call today that wants to um, so to think a little bit more in depth about change management, that recording is on our website, so you can go watch any time if you're interested, because it's, uh, I think that resilience and change management piece is, yeah, it's always been important, but right now we all need to be flexible and able to adapt. So uh, Adam, we've talked about it a little bit already, uh, virtual interviews are the norm now. Can you share any particular tips for success in a virtual interview that might differ from an in-person interview? Yeah, this is this is a great question, Michelle. I mean, I, I feel as though um, we're all experts to a certain degree in, in this area uh, because we're using it, you know, not only in our professional lives but also so much more in our, in our personal lives. Um, but a few things that I think are, are just good baseline, you know, reminders are make sure that your your camera, um, your computer is set up, you know, straight on. You want to try to uh, eliminate that that extra layer that is the the virtual conference or the zoom call or the teams call that we're doing so um, if you have as many of us do multiple screens set up there is one screen that has the camera on it make sure that's the one that you're looking at that's the one that's looking at you so you feel like it's a genuine conversation um, and you can kind of maybe hopefully uh, for a little bit forget that you're doing it over a video call um, so eye contact lighting you want to make sure that um, again you are not um, you know, you're not in a dark room. The, the interviewer can make out, you know, who they're talking to. Um, you want to make sure that you're taking the precautions um, um, to set yourself up for success prior to the meeting. So uh, make sure that you test the link, um, even if it's 15 minutes before. I mean, just make sure that everything is working. I've interviewed hundreds of people over the last year and, and they've all been over video. And, um, you know, the interviewer can tell oftentimes when you're checking the link, they'll be notified. Um, and if you don't, and 15 minutes into the call, you're still trying to set up your technology. You know, it, people are um, uh, empathetic to a certain degree, but they want to make sure, you know, you, you, your first impression um, is that interview. So you want to make sure that you're set up and ready to go. Um, give yourself lots of time. Uh, make sure that you can to uh, your best uh, ability. Um, eliminate any um, disruptions or interference. Uh, if it's your, you know, your spouse, your kids, your pets, um, your roommates, let them know that you're going to be occupied for the next hour and a half because you're on a very important call. You don't need anybody barging in the room. We've, we've all seen the, the viral videos of that happening. Um, you know, maybe even give yourself a, a buffer of 15 minutes on each end. Um, and dress for the parts. Um, this, is, this is really important because we're all in a little bit more of a, um, a casual environment when we're working from home, if we're working from our you know, home office or 
um, their bedrooms in some cases, um, within our kitchen, you know, you're not always going to be, you know, suit and tie or, or formal attire. Um, but for the sake of an interview, dress like you would um, if you were going into the office, if you're actually meeting these individuals in person, it'll make you feel better. Um, and, and, you know, you'll, you'll hopefully have more confidence because of it. Um, one thing that is, is interesting, and we used to um, educate or, or um, recommend candidates to this even before virtual interviews became the norm. Uh, and that was video recording yourself, rehearsing the interview um, leading up to it. It's even more prevalent now because um, as we all know, when you get on the, the video call, you're gonna see yourself um, um, going through these questions. And that can be a little bit shocking at first. Um, so it doesn't hurt to rehearse this uh, over video. Uh, we all have the capability now. Um, so I, I do find that, that you know, candidates do report back to us saying that that does give them a little bit more more confidence going in. And then finally, um, you know, uh, make sure that your, your, your room, your, your kitchen, wherever it is, um, blurring your background can help, but make sure it's, it's clean, it's in order. You know, you don't have a messy, un, untidy bed behind you. Um, you know, we, we have horror stories of candidates doing that to us or, or, or doing it with our employers or our clients uh, over the last year. So uh, make sure that you're aware of that kind of stuff. Um, again, this is a, a, a first impression. Um, and just as a safety precaution, wear pants. You never know if you're gonna stand up. So just make sure that you're wearing pants. Uh, that was an incredible treasure trove of, of tips you just laid on us, Adam. Thank you for that. Uh, and actually, I haven't had to do a virtual interview before and um, those tips were really helpful to put me in the position of the person that does all the things you have to think about that you don't have to think about when you go into an office. So thank you for that. Uh, Sherry, we're going to ask you to talk about virtual interviews as well, but maybe from a, just a different perspective. So speaking as an employer, are there things that candidates, um, so Adam talked a lot about the things to do to make sure you do, but can you talk about things that employers have as expectations? So things that candidates should really not do uh, in, a, in a virtual interview? Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. Um, it's, it's interesting, you know, Adam talked about, you know, we've all seen the, the viral um, feeds that have gone out of people who are you know, conducting a newscast and, you know, their kids are crawling across the floor and their wife's crawling in after them. So I think, you know, to Adam's point, it's extremely important that, you know, if you're in a household, that everybody in your household understands that, you know, you're going into an important meeting and, and that's important. Um, don't use filters. <laughs> We've all seen the cat filter um, that has gone viral as well. So try to, to, to set those things up. Um, I guess no different than any interview you're going through. Try not to, and I know you're going to prepare beforehand and you're probably going to have some notes, but try not to rely on your notes completely. You know, if, if you've got notes in front of you, maybe have them so they're bullet points with very few long sentences that you have to read through the whole sentence to get to what you're looking for. Um, I've done that myself where, you know, you've got five paragraphs of something and you're trying to pick out the keywords. It's impossible to do that when someone's asked you a question on something. So again, I would don't rely on your notes would be extremely important. Um, have some bullet points in front of you. Um, and again, just make sure that you've got a private place. It's extremely important if you can do that. Great, thank you for that. So um, I think that now we're gonna move on to um, uh, back over to Adam. So Adam, I can imagine you spend a lot of time in interviews. I know uh, Sherry does too, but your work is, is recruitment all the time. And so I can imagine you spend a lot of time in interviews. Have the questions that are being asked during the pand pandemic shifted at all? Like, are there, are there different questions that people need to be prepared to answer now? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because, um, you know, a lot of, you know, we conduct a lot of interviews and then we get a lot of feedback on interviews from our, our, our clients, so employers. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say, you know, in terms of um, skill assessment, you know, those questions have changed that drastically. Um, but I will say that there's a couple questions, a couple things that will come up in interviews that 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 wouldn't have pre um, pre pandemic, and and that's around um, the adaptability, the flexibility of a candidate. So, for instance, if a if 
an individual is being considered for a job um, that they would in, in normal times want the individual to be in the office um, 100% of the time. Questions around their flexibility that once you know safety precautions have lifted in their respective municipality, um, are they, are they okay with coming back into the office? You know, deeming that this is intended to be a, in office 100% of the time or, or you know, four days a week, three days a week, are you comfortable with that? So those are questions that you, you may encounter. Um, another thing is around, and I think, I think Sherry had mentioned it earlier, is around the um, adaptability of individuals and maybe uh, more so leaning towards how resourceful they are um, with certain, um, technologies or certain tools, especially communication tools. Um, we're all using some form of Microsoft Teams or Slack um, or Zoom or um, um, Skype, uh, I guess, uh, to a certain degree, far more than we, we ever were. So understanding um, individuals' um, ability and comfort, um, not only to just jump on a call and use them, but maybe manage individuals or pro lead projects uh, fully remotely through those tools. Um, questions like that may arise. Um, so being, having a, um, an answer to that, um, preferably backed up with an example, uh, can become really, really important. Um, so that's something that's changed. And then I, I, this isn't really the types of questions, but just the way the interviews are conducted, right? We are now behind a, a virtual screen. There's, there's, a, there's, there's um, you know, a, a layer in between us now. And because of that, and because of some of the, the points I made earlier around uh, efficiencies, um, you know, sometimes there's less small talk, there's less niceties, um, and employers may come across as um, a little cold, um, and, and you may not know why. So it can leave candidates feeling a little bit um, uh, insecure, I guess, in terms of how they were perceived by the employer. Um, but conversely, now that we're, you know, welcoming people into our, our living rooms, into our homes, there, there's a little bit more empathy sometimes too. Um, people are, are very open to talking about how they're doing, um, how they're coping with the, the stress from the pandemic, how they're coping with, you know, everyone being under the, the same roof and working and, and going to school and stuff like that. So you see kind of both sides of the coin there. Um, and again, those are things that, um, you know, you may not have had to deal with uh, as much before the pandemic. It's really interesting to think about. Um, Sherry, a similar question for you, but from the other perspective. So wondering if there are different questions that you would encourage candidates to be asking the employers now. So maybe things that weren't as important before that now are really important as a candidate. Um, I, don't, I don't know if the questions have really changed, to be honest with you, Michelle. I, I think the questions are still as important. And, and you know, when I, when I think about it, not only are we interviewing you, you're interviewing us. And it's so important that the two are, are meshing together. Um, you know, do your research, understand a little bit more about the company so you're prepared to ask questions, you know, ask them what their values are, you know, to make sure you're well aligned with the values. The last thing you want to do is join an organization that your values are just misaligned. Um, you know, we, we strongly encourage that. We, I know on our, on our side, in our organization, we prompt on that a lot, trying to understand, you know, if our values are aligned, um, making sure that the work culture, I think, is a fit for you as well. So asking those questions. The one question you may want to ask, you know, with COVID going on, what are they doing with respect to COVID? You know, I think, it, again, it's so important that people understand that before they walk in the door, you want to really understand if, if safety is an important part of their values and what are they doing? with respect to COVID. Great, thank you for that. So um, we just a reminder to everyone, we, we do have, um, I, I could ask questions for days. I've got all kinds for both of you, but uh, if there's any pressing questions, we are coming to the time when I'm gonna start checking the Q&A to see if there's any live questions. So just pop over that Q&A tab if you have any questions that you, you wanna ask. And even if there's no questions you wanna ask, go read and see if other people have put some there that you wanna, you wanna vote for. So uh, Adam, what is one piece of practical advice that you would give someone who's just starting out in their job search? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I don't know if I have one. Um, I, I would say, and, and I think that this is um, um, told to many people before, but it, it's, it's very true and it's treat it like a job. 
Like you have to be persistent. You have to go about it um, in, a, in a very uh, strategic and persistent way. Uh, once you identify, you know, what the reason, the motivation, the passion and uh, for your, your um, um, you know, uh, you wanting to move on from the role you're in, whether it's, a ch you know, to, to have career trajectory in your current industry or move into another field entirely, you just have to be persistent and treat it like a job. And, and that goes back to the things that I was saying about networking and, and updating your resume and, and identifying the, the core competencies that are important, but treating it like a job is, is the underlying uh, thing, piece of advice that I would share um, and be easy on yourself because, um, you know, we are in a, in a job market that none of us have ever seen before. So for some people, it, it may happen very quickly. Uh, others, it may take a long time. We work with people um, that, um, you know, they start their career search and, and it, months can go by, half a year can go by, right? So it's different for everybody and, and depending on um, what kind of a change you're looking for um, can determine uh, how long how long that might take, and and then you know shameless plug work with the recruiter um, in a particular industry. Um, they may not be able to necessarily get you immediate interviews, but they may have some insight uh, as to what you can do to enhance the likelihood of getting interviews, um, or maybe even just introduce to 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 thought leaders in in the particular market you're looking for. So um, that would be my advice. So uh, even though I said I wasn't going to get to the live Q&A until later, Sherry, there's one that was posted that I think is a bit of a hot pursuit on your last uh, question. So I'm going to ask it now. Uh, it's from Victoria. And so when you're talking about asking questions um, of, of the company uh, to get to what their culture and their values are, uh, Victoria is asking if there are any, and, and I suppose Sherry or Adam can answer this if you've heard them uh, in the past, but are there any really great questions that, that they might be asked? able to ask like you can't just say you know what are what's your team culture so are there specific questions that might be able to draw that out that you can think of sure um i think just asking the question like how do you connect as a team you know you know how do you work together as a team what uh um you know in this day in this age of where mo vast majority of people are either like, i'm working in an office i come to work every day but we still use teams as our primary way of, of connecting together. So I think asking that question, how are you working as a team? Adam, I don't know if you have any more on that. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that that's, uh, that's a fair one for sure. Um, how you're able to um, uh, collaborate, communicate, maybe even taking one step further and just, uh, you know, asking have there been any issues uh, in regards to, to all this sudden change and, and how you've overcome some of those things. You know, that, those are things that we would ask candidates, but when, it, when a candidate asks that, um, that's a showing genuine interest. Um, so there's nothing wrong with that. I, I, I like questions like that. One of our attendees made a bit of a suggestion that I found interesting because it's it flips a question that I normally ask candidates. So he's saying that one one thing a candidate can ask is, imagine you hired me and it's a year from now and I had a banner year. What are the two to three things that you would point to as evidence of my success? And so I think that that says a lot about what the company values and what they're looking to get out of this relationship. I normally ask it in the other way. I normally ask the candidate that question, what they've accomplished, what we've accomplished together, but that was a great suggestion. So now I've got completely off my list here. So I've got to find out where I was. Um, so, uh, Adam, this is just a really quick follow-up to what you and I were talking about before I went off script. So, um, with all the uncertainty in the world right now, everything that's happening, is now the time to embark on a, on a career search? Yeah, um, great follow-up. So, that's, you know, there's a lot of subjectivity to, to that question, right? Um, you have to understand what your personal family financial situation is. And, and if all that checks out and you're motivated and you're passionate to make a move, um, I don't see anything wrong with, with doing that right now. Um, anecdotally, we're just as busy in placing candidates and working with employers uh, at this time um, this year as we were at this time last year. Um, so that tells us that um, employers are hiring, uh, there's opportunity out there, and that candidates um, are interested in, in taking advantage of those opportunities and, and focused on career trajectory. You know, there's never going to be a perfect time to make a move. There's, you know, you can't predict the job market, and and, and sometimes that perfect opportunity will, will fall on your plate. Um, 
you know, when you least expect it. So um, if everything checks out and, and you know, it's, it, it's okay for you and your family, I would encourage anyone uh, to entertain a job market right now. Great. Uh, so, so Sherry, now it's your turn to uh, use your crystal ball a bit. Uh, as we've referenced lots throughout the past 40 minutes, uh, we've seen a lot of dramatic changes in the past year. Do you think the recruitment process has changed forever? And if so, what are the most critical changes we should expect to face in a post-pandemic workplace? Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Um, I would say the recruitment process, and, and Adam will probably shrug a bit when I say this, but I think it has changed forever. Um, I agree with Adam. I think we're going to see a hybrid kind of emerge at the end of this once we kind of go back to kind of the new norm. But I think it has changed. I think we've we've catapulted to where we want it to be, um, that it was going to take a lot of time to get people to, to transform and to become used to doing video recruitment. Everyone is so used to it now. Taking that away from them, I think, will be very, very difficult. Um, you know, when I think, you know, we're, we're recruiting, you know, trades folks. And, you know, to, to say that we're not going to bring a person in personally to meet with the person, um, you know, if I look back 11 months ago, we would have said no way was that was that ever going to happen, and we, we've just hired 145 new tradespeople in the last uh, 30 days. So um, we did it all through video. So I would say, you know, I think it has changed um, forever. Um, it's given us more visibility on the global market than we've ever had um, because we don't have that barrier of trying to get someone to come here and it taking you know three days by the time we get here. Um, so I think it's changed. I really do. Again, I don't think it's going to stay where it is right now, but I think you're going to see some relaxing, and and hopefully it won't go back. It won't go back to where it was. Yeah, I've seen. Uh, I know we all see all kinds of memes and posts on social media, but one of my favorite ones in the last few months is about uh, as we all rush back to what was normal before, take time to think about what's what's worth rushing back to. And so I think we all need to think about Absolutely. the things we want to take with us out of this experience um, moving forward, whatever, whatever that is in your world. So thank you for that. Um, we have some specific questions that I uh, we received through registration and then I see a few coming in uh, live online now that we're going to move to. So the first one is about professional mentorship and I these are not assigned to either one of you. So I don't know how we're going to deal with that. Maybe just one of you start talking and we'll let it, let it flow. But the first one's about professional mentorship and hearing a lot about that being important. Uh, but the person that wrote to us said that they weren't really sure what they would lean on a professional mentor for. So wondering if either of you have ex experience with mentorship and, and what might be the most valuable benefit they could hope uh, to get out of a, a mentor-mentee relationship. Yeah, um, mentorship can mean a lot of things, I think. Um, you know. Um, I have multiple mentors and, and, and sometimes your mentors can become mentors, um, you know, um, without you even intending them to be that, right? You can have mentors within your workplace. You can have mentors within the various associations you're affiliated with. Um, I think the biggest thing, to, to be honest with you, um, that I've heard um, uh, from candidates or, or I've just seen myself is, is mentors can provide, um, you know, um, some reassurance to the things that you're thinking, the things that you're going through, um, knowing that they were once in your shoes, right? They can also um, provide some additional perspective, right? Just being able to talk out loud about what you're going through with, um, with mentors can be um, very reassuring. Um, but I, I truly think the biggest thing that, that they're able to do um, um, outside of work predominantly um, is, is give you, you know, enhance, help enhance your, your network. Um, mentors can uh, introduce you to other, um, you know, professional leaders or thought leaders in the, in the area that you're interested in um, and provide kind of um, an, an expedited path to those. Um, you know, it can mean a lot of different things for different people. Um, and I would encourage people to have many mentors, right? You don't just have one size fits all for every particular problem you encounter. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Sherry, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I would say in our organization, we're really um, trying to match people with a mentor based on the gap that they're trying to close. Um, so I think that's important. The other piece, as Adam mentioned, that you can have many different mentors. 
So the other concept that we're, we're toying a little bit with is the flash mentoring. So, you know, I've got a particular problem in a particular situation, in a particular field. I'm going to reach out to this person just for that flash moment. And I may never connect with that person again. So we're trying to encourage that as well. Yeah, I know um, uh, when Adam was talking, it made me think of one experience recently I had where someone wrote me a little note to tell me how much they appreciated having me as a mentor. And I burst out laughing and I called them right away. And I was like, no, no, you're my mentor. I don't know. I, I really didn't know they viewed me that way because I viewed them as my mentor. So the relationship can go, it can be mutually beneficial for sure. Um, so the next question was submitted to us uh, through registration as well. And it has to do with people who have uh, emigrated to a new country and uh, maybe having a challenge breaking into the labor market in that country. Um, you know, certainly we've seen news and reports about this being a little bit more challenging and they're just wondering if there's anything that, that an applicant uh, can do to overcome maybe some of the unconscious bias that exists um, with employers. I know that the onus should be on the employers to be trained in unconscious bias, but is, are there things that applicants can do to overcome that? Who wants to tackle that one? <laughs> um, again, I would, you know, speaking from, from our, my organization, you know, we have people from all over the world who have joined us. So, you know, I think the big piece is recognizing what your status is as an immigrant. So, um, you know, we're, we don't have the capability necessarily to, to hire folks who have joined up, who have joined, landed here in Canada who are on a temporary work permit, as an example. So really understanding kind of what your, what your status is and what you can bring to the table, I think is important. Obviously we as an organization um, play a big part in that, but you know, we have a number of things that we have, we have to work through as well with, with people who have um, on the immigration side. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 very well said. Um, you know, as, as employers or as agencies, we're constantly going through um, unconscious bias um, training, right? But it still creeps in, right? And 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 so, um, like sure you said, understanding uh, your status and and really um, articulating that you, your skill set and the resume can go a long way. That without, I would say, is is the best suggestion that I would have. Great. So we have some questions from Julianne. There, are, there's two questions, but they're kind of connected. So. She's asking for a little bit of advice on how to seek out and find remote work opportunities. If there's certain places that you might recommend that or, or ways someone would try to find that. But also right now, and we mentioned it already, you're in the middle of an interview, you're probably gonna be working remotely to start, but if you're interested in continuing that post COVID, what's a good way to approach that with the employer? Okay, sorry, what was the first part of the question? Where to The first to part was just if there's, if there's a good way to seek out uh, remote work opportunities, so. Yeah, I, I'm comfortable with this one. So the, um, you know, familiarizing yourself with the, the different job boards, and that includes LinkedIn and, and Monster and, and Indeed, um, and, you know, a lot of job searching, um, both, you know, uh, from us on the agency side or for uh, candidates is, is done through virtual job boards, right? Um, the keyword search is, is the best way to do it. A lot of employers um, um, are advertising as, um, you know, remote work or, or some, you know, form of remote working uh, arrangement is in the job description or is in the location or is in the title even. So that would be my suggestion in terms of how to, to, to seek them out. Um, you know, some employers will, um, you know, deem them um, as 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 in office positions. But during the COVID, um, you know, lockdown periods, they will obviously allow uh, em uh, employees uh, to work from home. The best way to go about finding those, it'd probably just be a matter of where you're searching. Um, Monster, indeed, the LinkedIn, the main job boards are are, are the be best bet in my opinion. We're kind of losing you there a bit, Adam. I don't know if everyone else is or if it's just me, but I don't know if you're done, but I'm going to interrupt and <laughs> move on to another. We just lost you just for a second, Adam. Um, so we're going to move on then to another. Unless, Sherry, did you want to add anything to that or do you? Uh, sorry about that. 
Yeah, no, I, I would agree with Adam. I, if you look at any of the job boards, people are very, I think companies are very open to saying whether or not it's a permanent work from work remotely or not permanent. And, and they're very clear and I believe in most of the postings. Um, in our workplace, um, our, our, uh, our president always says you can't build a ship from home. So <laughs> okay. most of our work is, is here at the shipyard, so. Yeah. yeah, so you just have to focus on it being safe for sure. Exactly. So um, if, if it isn't, if you're not building ships and you're doing something that feasibly could be from home, do you have any advice for Julianne on how to, um, so if you're in an interview and it's remote work to start, but you're interested in that long-term, any advice on how to broach that with the employer? I think be, be open with them. I mean, don't, don't be, you know, I, I wouldn't be, um, so direct to say, you know, you know, my point is I want to work from home forever. Take, approach it in, in more of a curiosity. Be curious about what really, how they're going to approach it and see what comes back with you, back, back from them, I should say. Yeah, that's really great advice. Um, so we have a question from a new graduate and uh, Robin's wondering, uh, so someone who's new, just entering the workforce, they have limited experience in their field. How can, how can someone like that um, increase their confidence uh, in an employer recruiter that, that they would be a good fit for the company? So from application straight through to interview, what kinds of things should they be saying? They might not have the, a lot of experience, but they know they'd be right for it. How, how can they, what tips do you have to help convince an employer of that? Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think that um, a new graduate has to be um, aware that they're not expected to know everything, right? Um, limited, if, if any, experience coming right out of, of school, right? Um, I think that doing your research and understanding, you know, um, some really interesting things about the company or understanding your reason um, um, subjectively that you're interested in, uh, the company are, are very good things that can come out in an in a, uh, interview. When my clients talk to me about why they're interested in junior applicants, it's, it's very rare that it's because one candidate's core competencies or intelligence or skill set are so much higher than another individual's. It's, it's usually this individual's characteristics, their, their intangibles, why they were interested, how they got along with the uh, the interviewers and and really understanding and believing in their genuine interest in uh, the company in terms of in terms of um, skills set or skill fit or core competency for the particular role um, you know there should be a baseline obviously but you can educate yourself um, on 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 interesting trends what um, you know an individual needs to um, uh, possess or needs to be strong in and that kind of the next level up those are things that you can you know be self-taught or, or start to look into um, but I think in terms of a, a junior applicant um, really standing out is is really having that genuine interest and in, and in maybe uh, portraying that long-term uh, fit or alignment with the company uh, in the interview. If I may, Michelle, just to add to what Adam had said, I, I would say you may not have the what you call the experience, but you've had exposure in other areas. So you've gone through university, you've worked in groups, you know, you, you've done work. So don't hesitate to rely back on that. And I know when we're going through interviews with, with people who don't necessarily have the work experience quasi, um, we ask them to reflect upon their experiences they've had in working with groups in school working on projects, how did, how did you present yourself? Those types of things. Don't hesitate to rely back on that. I think that's important. Yeah, I think that's really important. We, um, again, I don't, I'll keep referring back to it, but just we've done some good programming this year. We've had a couple of uh, career talk sessions that we've led that were specific for our students this year. And I know that some of the discussions in those sessions were helping students to understand how to translate their university experience into into what you put on a resume and just sort of that transferable uh, skill set. So again, those were all recorded and they're available on our website if anyone's interested to go back and look at those. Um, but we also had a question. So that was from a young alum, alumnus or alumna. But we have uh, we had a few questions submitted to us during registration from mid career alumni, um, and I've kind of merged them into one question. But they were multiple questions. So um, so from a mid career pr perspective. 
Can you talk a little bit about um, how best to sort of test the market? It can be a bit risky if you're already employed, like how, how to sort of test the market if you're looking to make a bit of a career shift. Um, and then, and then uh, if you extend past that, someone that might be later in their career, any tips you have for working in an environment where um, you find yourself, uh, everyone is younger than you and the technology is different and all that kind of stuff. So we had those questions from sort of mid-career and then older career alumni just asking for, um, for tips on making that transition. Anything helpful that you can think of there? Um, sure, I can talk to the, um, um, the transition one. If, depends on, on, on where you're, you know, if you're looking to transition into, um, you know, more senior role within your current field um, or into, a, into a, a different field, I guess they're a little bit different. In, in terms of the confidentiality, um, you know, working with a recruiter, again, shameless plug, but I think that that does, that does go a long way. You can pick their brain um, around what's going on in the market and get a sense of, you know, either what, you know, the volume or the scale of opportunities are out there or um, uh, in, in more detail, maybe what you would need to do to enhance your candidacy to make yourself more attractive to employers. Um, ways of doing that, uh, again, I think the easy um, network connections, whether they're friends or your kind of your inner circle who are in the positions or the industries you are um, interested in and reaching out very confidential, very confidentially um, to get understanding of, of what you would need to do um, or whether or not you're, you're viable or you're an um, attractive candidate for those positions. That's how I would encourage anyone to, to quote unquote, test the waters. Um, um, but there can be, you know, various different strategies. That, that, that would be my go-to though. And I forget the other part of that. Uh, well, then the second part is just, it's actually similar to the, the person that's a young alumni, but just on the other side of it. So it can be a bit overwhelming to be um, in, later in your career and, and trying to convince employees to hire you. And then also, um, you know, adjusting to a workforce where, you know, everyone around you is sort of younger, including your bosses, protect potentially. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're losing you there, Adam. So I'm sure. just gonna- uh, get... Yeah, and, and, and Sherry, you could probably speak to this maybe um, from seeing it in the office. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, go for it. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, the only person that you're, you're hurting is yourself by not going for it. And, you know, put yourself, I know it's uncomfortable. Um, having moved to, we just, recently moved from New Brunswick to Nova Scotia and my husband's having to put himself out there. So, you know, I'm just constantly popping him up and, and saying, you, you, you got this, you've got your experience underneath you. You just have to reiterate that to other folks and get them to see what, what everybody else is seeing. I think that's really great advice for a lot of, so we have questions from young alumni, we have questions from mid-career and older alumni, and then I just see one from a mom that's been out of the workforce for five years who's nervous about getting back in. I think that answer no. you just gave, Sherry, is perfect for all of those people. So just, okay. just go for it. Be confident and, and go for it. Yeah. So and, and we have, you, may not, you may not get the first job you apply for, but that's going to help you with the next job you apply for. That's right. Uh, we're going to we're gonna wrap up here in just a minute, but I saw one come in that I just really want to answer. If we could get a quick sort of rapid fire answer uh, from either Adam or Sherry about this. Uh, it's about that sort of um, not public uh, workforce. So, so someone doesn't have a job posting, but you're interested in working for them. How do you, how do you approach an employer about a, that, about a, a job opportunity that isn't, isn't there, isn't posted? You know, I would say find out who the recruiters are. Yeah. Reach out, keep in touch with recruiters. And, you know, Adam, I know I'm giving you a little bit of a plug there, but um, they've got their insight into not just, you know, we don't just, you know, our recruiters, our talent acquisition specialists are not just recruiting people to a job that we have posted. They're out there sourcing candidates continually. Um, they've got people that they're looking for a job that we don't even have posted and we won't have posted for another five years. So keep those networks going. I think as Adam said, you know, there's a lot of times when a, a person may have um, a role that, you know, they're, they're looking to move things along quickly. Other people, it, it could take six months. It could take a year. 
but keep those networks connect, keep connected and don't hesitate to reach out. LinkedIn is a great place to link to, to reach out through. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's very well said. I mean, there's no such thing as a bad conversation. So, you know, if, if at the end of the day, you're just broadening your, your network. So that couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> Perfect. So I really could talk to both of you all day, um, but we're going to be conscious of everyone's time, including yours. So we're going to wrap up now. Uh, I did just want to, there was one question that was submitted during registration that I can actually answer despite not being an HR specialist. So I'm going to spend a bit of time on that and then do a little bit of a wrap up. So we had a question from someone asking for tips on how to uh, get started with LinkedIn. We talked about it a lot. I think it's, it's so important now. They're asking for tips on how to get started with it and whether or not there are companies who provide sort of resume and LinkedIn profile reviews. And so uh, I've got three answers for you. So to start, uh, one of our upcoming UNB Talks online sessions features a UNB alumna who specializes in LinkedIn. So she's, she's a LinkedIn trainer. Uh, and the session is on March 31st. It's called The Power of LinkedIn and Social Reciprocity. So uh, there's going to be lots of great stuff in there if that's something that you're interested in. Uh, there absolutely are people that help to review uh, resumes and LinkedIn profiles and things like that. So uh, we'll hear a little bit about that on March 31st. Uh, but we also did two sessions last spring when our 2020 grads were... Um, we just wanted to do something to help those students that were graduating last spring and entering a really uncertain world. And we had a sort of four part series um, for those grads and two of the sessions specifically were on LinkedIn. Uh, I'll get Jenny to, uh, Jenny posted the link there to register for the, so the one that's coming up. And I'll also ask Jenny if she can post the link for uh, where the recordings are of those two sessions that we did in the spring that were specifically on LinkedIn. So um, one was called The Fundamentals of LinkedIn and the other one was called Networking on LinkedIn. So they're great sessions led by a UMB alumna. Um, and and uh, we do know a few UMB alumni who do this exact kind of work. So if you're looking to be connected with one of them, that's one of our jobs in the alumni office is to connect our alumni to, to each other. So you can email us at alumni at umb.ca if you want to be connected to some people that might be able to help with your LinkedIn profile and your resumes and stuff. We'd be happy to connect you. So that was me answering one of the HR questions. So there you go. <laughs> um, so thank you, uh, Sherry and Adam, so much for taking the time with us today. We get so much out of these sessions. We're so grateful to you to, to take this time to spend with us and share your expertise and insights with your fellow alumni. Um, we, um, you know, we, um, from, from our perspective, uh, we do these things to help our, our alumni connect with one another and to learn from one another. So it's, uh, you know, really exciting to have had you with us today. Thank you. Um, we will, if you have any other questions that we didn't answer, we'll try to answer them in our follow-up email that we send out. So uh, shortly in the coming days, everybody who registered will receive an email from us with a post-event survey um, and with, um, you know, the, the link to this recording and also the LinkedIn profiles for Sherry and Adam, if you want to connect with them afterwards. And in that, if there's any questions we missed, we'll try to get Sherry and Adam to answer them uh, uh, in writing for you in that email. So uh, we hope that everyone really enjoyed um, the last hour. I know that I did. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. One final thing that I did want to say is that uh, our, our programs that we offer through the Associate Alumni are only made possible by some of the partners that we, do, we have. So obviously our alumni who come in and share their insights with us, but we also have uh, affinity partners that support our programming. And I think Jenny had a slide she was going to share. I don't see it in front of me, but uh, I'll just, I'll just, oh, here it comes. So uh, we would like to say thank you to our affinity partners who help to fund all of our programming efforts. Uh, TD Insurance offers home and auto insurance to alumni and students. Manulife, who offers health, dental, and life insurance. Um, and then MBNA, who offers a credit card. And so those are really great uh, um, products that you can afford yourself uh, of as an alumni, but then we also get a benefit as an association and allows us to run events like this. And there is a little bit of a screen up there that shows you some of our upcoming events if you're interested in, in joining us for any of those. We hope that we'll, we'll see you at those in the coming, coming months, coming weeks. So thank you so much to all of our attendees for joining us today. And a special thank you to Diane McAdam and Jenny Knutson on the alumni office who, who were in the back end making sure this went smoothly. I uh, enjoyed spending the last hour with everyone. Have a great day. Bye.